Pointer? Pointer. Pointer is right here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, and thank you to uh, Terry, Carolyn, and Jennifer, and the rest of the group that organized this uh, very uh, interesting and stimulating um, workshop. So I, I will share with you the experience uh, uh, in Singapore um, from the Singapore Health Sciences Authority. Okay, just to get oriented, uh, Singapore is a tropical country uh, located just one degree north of the equator, and our nearby neighbors are Malaysia and Indonesia. A little further afield is Thailand, and quite a bit to the north and east is Taiwan, and even further uh, north and east is, is Japan. Oh, sorry. Okay, so it's a very small country. 26 miles wide and uh, 17 miles north-south in this island. And just for some perspective, um, it's only slightly larger than the area encircled by the Washington Beltway. So we have uh, some advantages of being a very compact country. Okay. So there are 5.5 million people in the country. Uh, about 70% are citizens and permanent residents. And uh, the ethnic composition of uh, that group is uh, three quarters um, Chinese ancestry, 13.3% Malays, and 9.1% Indians, um, and then a small percentage of others. Oh, um, so, sorry. So one thing I did want to mention is that it does not have uh, a national health insurance system. There's um, mandatory deduction um, from wages to medical savings plans that you can use uh, for large uh, hospital expenditures. Um, there's a system of um, uh, polyclinics, which are um, subsidized by the government, but most of the uh, primary care is um, taken care of through private uh, GP clinics, uh, to private GP uh, practices. Um, so the the health the population is very sensitive to uh, costs of medical um, uh, procedures. So the Health Sciences Authority is a relatively new um, governmental uh, organization. It's only 14 years old, and it consists of um, three, uh, three, three major groups. The Health Products Regulation Group, um, which uh, has a function very similar to FDA, uh, CEDAR, CBER, and CDRH, um, and it's mostly uh, primarily organized by pre-market and post-market, not by uh, clinical um, discipline. And uh, there are about 300 people who work in that part of the organization. They also run the National Blood Bank, and then they have an applied sciences group, which does um, all the forensics and some of the um, uh, drug quality testing. OK, so uh, I'm affiliated with the uh, vigilance um, uh, program. And so uh, HSA, like most uh, drug regulatory authorities, um, collects uh, cases of uh, adverse drug, rea uh, drug reactions. It's a voluntary system. Um, and uh, if we organize it by system organ class, uh, skin and appendages disorders is the largest class with um, uh, about 50% um, coming in under that category. And um, from about 2009 to 2012, about um, 80 to 100 cases of SJS TEN were um, in that uh, were received by um, HSA per year, 100 about 100 per year. So in uh, 2008, we launched a pharmacogenetics initiative. I think I mentioned yesterday that the um, oops, oh, sorry, how do I go back? Um, that uh, the chairman of the um, uh, of the Health Sciences Authority was also director of um, uh, the Genome Institute, and he urged us to move in that direction of um, um, trying to figure out how we could use um, the advances in knowledge and genomics to um, toward regulatory science. And um, so, really, we had some simple ob objectives to build some in-house expertise in pharmacogenetics, establish uh, collaborative networks with healthcare professionals and research institutes, and build some infrastructure to collect and store DNA samples 
um, and the associated phenotype data or clinical data uh, of patients experiencing um, ADRs, and also to collect drug tolerant controls. And the uh, ultimate goal was to um, be able to update drug package inserts and make recommendations to healthcare professionals based on local data. So we started out uh, first uh, setting up clinical sites at the two major hospitals, um, the National University Hospital and Singapore um, General Hospital in 2009. And we worked um, with the dermatology departments, because we were mostly interested in um, the high number of uh, SJSTEN cases. And, uh, and then we also were collaborating with um, neurology departments because we needed to collect the drug tolerant controls for um, the anti-epileptic drugs that um, seem to comprise uh, a large number of the SJSTEN cases. Um, and uh, more recently, we've uh, added two other sites, uh, Changi General Hospital and also the National Skin Center. So altogether, we have four sites. And recently, we also expanded um, and are now collecting dress cases. So um, uh, we have now, um, after five years, uh, 59 cases. Um, Anti-epileptics is the largest category. Um, then we have antibiotics. We have seven allopurinol cases. And then a smattering of other things. And in that other things, we uh, are, includes two cases of strontium raleate. OK, so um, we. Uh, collected 13 carbamazepine cases and 26 uh, drug match controls. These were uh, patients who had been on carbamazepine for at least three months with no reaction. And all 13 of our cases were 1502 positive, and uh, whereas only three of 26 were um, HLA positive in our controls. So we were able to validate the uh, finding from the Taiwan group uh, that this was um, a very significant um, association in our local population. Uh, in the three, 13 cases were three Malay, uh, people of Malay ancestry. OK, so while the collection was going on, we were also concerned about um, uh, the cost of um, screening um, all patients who would be going on to anti-epileptics. Um, and um, trying to understand what would be the economic burden of requiring that. So we worked with uh, Duke NUS, the health systems um, and services uh, group, and they helped us to uh, develop um, a, a a cost-effectiveness model. Um, our population was newly diagnosed adult epilepsy patients for whom carbamazepine or phenytoin were a considered appropriate treatment. And we looked at three different strategies, just the status quo, which is give it when you need it and deal with the SJSTEN as it occurs, um, genotype, and then um, prescribe carbamazepine, phenytoin only to those who tested negative, and then give um, valproate um, or some other alternative for those who test positive. And then the third one was just, just to start avoiding carbamazepine altogether. Actually, we've been hearing from a lot of neurologists that that's what they were doing, because um, they'd heard about the uh, uh, the association. And then in that case, just um, you go to some other alternative uh, drugs. Um, so just to show you the prevalence of HLA 1502 um, in the different ethnic groups in Singapore, it's um, present in about one in eight to 10 uh, Chinese. Uh, it's very common in Malays, one in five, um, much less common in uh, Singapore Indians. And then um, from uh, other um, uh, global databases, we found that it's probably about 1 in 500 in Caucasians and less than 1 in 1,000 in Japanese. So it's certainly not a pan-Asian marker. So we uh, developed a uh, decision tree analysis. And um, we use a common metric, which is the inter incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Um, and a commonly accepted um, cost effectiveness threshold is if you have to spend um, $50,000 US or less to achieve one quality adjusted life year, then that's considered cost effective. So if we use an ethnicity weighted um, uh, approach to the Singapore population, it came out to uh, 30,000. So overall, it was cost effective. But if you drill down a little bit deeper into the um, different ethnic groups, you see that it is co um, cost effective for Chinese Malays, not so much for uh, Indians. 
Okay, so um, with the cost effectiveness um, findings and the strong um, odds ratio um, in the uh, case control collection, we felt we needed to um, you know, update the drug label. But before doing that, we um, held a consultation session with um, clinicians. And um, we told them that we wanted to go out with something very strong in the label, and we got a lot of resistance. And they said that, well, um, you know, the test costs 300 US dollars, and it takes a week to get it back. And um, that's just too much money. And we need to know the answer faster. So we had a lot of discussion about how to, how to uh, deal with this issue. And we came to the conclusion that um, we needed to have a centralized testing uh, facility so that we could get economies of scale and, and the throughput so that we could um, turn around the samples faster. And uh, the director of the National University Hospital Molecular Diagnostic Center offered to um, uh, screen various formats for this test and validate one um, and become the um, centralized um, facility. So she was able to get the cost down to under um, like about 170 US dollars and turn around time two to four days. Um, we were happy with that, too, because at the time, the only place where uh, you could get this um, test was at the blood bank, which they, they do for um, uh, you know, tissue typing. And so we felt a little uncomfortable saying, um, you know, we're going to mandate a test, but you've got to come to us. OK, so um, anyway, we uh, just to quickly then go through. Um, this was what we came out with our final recommendation. The Ministry of Health came in and said, this is now standard of care. Um, HSA changed the package insert to highly recommend testing. We stayed away from the mandated. But we did have some caveats. It's not required in patients who've been taking carbamazepine for more than three months. Um, we said it shouldn't be prescribed before knowing the results, um, that you should not use phenytoin either if you're positive. And, uh, and then we had some other caveats that you should still um, maintain appropriate clinical vigilance. And we've had about 200 tests per quarter. Um, the rate's been pretty constant over the last year and so. And uh, since making st testing standard of care, we haven't had any cases, whereas before we had, on average, 15 cases a year of carbamazepine, SJS, TEN. So just as my last slide, um, we learned through this, uh, it was really important to engage the uh, clinicians, especially, um, and uh, that we needed to um, really focus on lowering cost and turnaround time, and that we needed the co uh, cost-effective analysis to help the Ministry of uh, Health uh, come in with, a, actually, they came in with a 75% subsidy for low-income patients. And that really helped cushion the um, effect of our recommendation. So uh, these are the people involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions and, and discussion. Uh, I was just wondering about um, B1502 um, and screening and, and the issue of if, if it's, it's pretty clear in Southeast Asian populations um, that if SJSTN does occur, it's going to occur in a B75 zero type that's not 1502 in a screening type situation. Um, so I was wondering, I guess, first question is if, if, uh, if you've got any information about the B75 zero types other than B1502 um, and whether it might be a cost effective approach just to actually identify B15 given that most of the B15 in Southeast Asian populations will be the B75 zero types, in, just to encapsulate all of the risk alleles, um, even though there's only a very small risk, I guess, of, of having B15, uh, B75 zero types outside of B1502, there still is a risk. Uh, well, um, so we know that there's, uh, in the Malay population, I think it's 1511 or 1513, I'm not quite, I can't remember, that's actually quite high, so that and I don't think that that's associated with um, SJS, so we did need to go to 1502 to four-digit resolution. Does that? I'm not an immunologist, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's a way of or of, of designing an assay, um, like you know, even an SSOP or a molecular assay that sort of defines a, the risk 
uh, without actually, you know, as a sort of screening test. Um, I guess similar to what we did for 5701, where we actually defined sort of, you know, in the unlikely setting that there were rare alleles that came up that were very similar to 5701 that might be risk alleles that you'd still be defining that area at risk. Um, and I'm not uh, sure I, if that's been done for 1502 or B75. I know in other populations and, you know, when Hung and Xuan Yu, you've had, you've had certainly a, 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 a number of patients that have had B1521, um, which is another risk allele. Um, in Taiwan, we most of hospitals do the easier way. B15, just look at it, B1502, because the, there will be, the, the time is, is quicker than to look at all the HIV phenotype, uh, genotype. But some hospitals can uh, provide the, all the HIV genotype instead of HIV1502. So uh, we, we, if we, uh, some hospitals have the more information about all the HIV genotype. If we find some patient with B75 earlier, such like 1511 or 15, 15, uh, 58, then we will also recommend should be careful and recommend them to, to show another anti-evidence yeah. drug. So well, that we, we, but it's not just not, not, not available for most of the hospitals, about, about 10%. Could you use your microphone? Please. With deep sequencing techniques now, some of the alleles that were, were previously called B1502, for instance, on Sanger sequencing actually will be recalled B1521 anyway. So hmm. uh, I, I just wonder if there's any data of, of how much of, I would assume we're, po we're encapsulating most of the risk population by screening for B1502, but it's not the entire risk population, I guess, is the issue. So you're, never, you're not quite up to the 100% negative predictive value, not, not including all of the B75 serotypes, but it may be very population-specific, yeah. I guess, thank so that's we, one consideration. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phillips. Uh, that's a very relevant comment, but we need to go on, please, to uh, the next presentation on the Indonesia experience. And we have Dr. Rika Yuli Wulandari, uh, who is the head of the Yarsi Research Institute at Yarsi University? I have your slide. Which one is it? 